I'd like to thank everyone for inviting me to this conference. And uh, as I said last night at our opening, that it's crucial to understand uh, the evidence-based facts, which has um, been the major motivation for me to uh, engage in this discussion. Um, there is a tendency for uh, the utilization of uh, propaganda to advance specific uh, ethno-linguistic initiatives. And so what I admire about uh, connecting science and society is the objective to understand uh, differences through uh, reality. Um, so first of all, I think it's important to speak to the question of uh, language and linguistic differences. Um, today I was very much uh, impressed by the presentations and certainly learned uh, a significant amount from each of them, uh, primarily because of uh, the intricacies that developed uh, in the last several hundred years but particularly with the fall of several empires in this uh, part of the world, the Austro-Hungarian, the Russian Empire, and so forth and so on, Ottoman, uh, which have uh, been the primary, primary drivers of uh, some of these linguistic movements. Now, I certainly think that uh, every group should have a right to speak their own language uh, the way they wish in their communities and within their homes and so forth. Uh, so I see that as a very important uh, point, but I would also add to that um, the idea of language is something, in terms of the written language, is something relatively new and something that is derived out of the development of the nation state, uh, particularly strong nation states, uh, and uh, through uh, universal education processes. So that uh, for most of humanity, uh, language has not gone back more than 150 years. Um, uh, most of our uh, progenitors, our ancestors, were unable to um, have a codified language that they were all agreeing upon or even, if, even reading for that matter. And so over the course of the last 75 to 100 years, especially since the end of the Second World War, there has been a growing level of um, linguistic um, initiatives on the part of uh, many, uh, many forces. Um, and uh, some have been more successful and others have been less successful. So that today we have uh, languages that have yet to be codified, have yet to have a written uh, form, uh, and uh, that are being, um, are in the process of being codified. Um, and it's perhaps the majority of languages that have not been codified. Uh, certainly that isn't true necessarily in Europe and uh, uh, North America. Uh, but for the most part, um, uh, by and large, we can say very clearly that um, these uh, linguistic differences have been the cause of uh, a tremendous amount of conflict. Um, and so uh, one of the key issues that I think uh, some of the presenters have uh, raised and which I would also uh, advance is that um, how is language, how is religion, uh, and how is culture used to advance a specific kind of ethno-political uh, movement? And uh, in this way, uh, there is no, I don't intend to advance this uh, discussion by arguing that there is a correct or an incorrect form of uh, linguistic uh, movement and so forth. But um, as we all know, the larger the political unit, 
the larger the state, the larger the empire, if you will, uh, but the larger the state, um, ironically, the greater the degree to which there are linguistic rights. Um, and uh, that the smaller the state, um, the divisions, the balkanization of states, as we heard so interestingly before, uh, contributes to the growing level of denial of rights. Um, and so in this case, there is a propensity to um, create higher levels of conflict um, as a consequence of advancing uh, linguistic and even religious rights within specific smaller units when in the past uh, or even in the present uh, those kinds of conflicts are not as um, ever present in larger states. So uh, one, I would also add a, another caveat to this and that is that within the context of some countries, some regions of the world, um, the past is not under contestation. Uh, these uh, cultures and societies have been around far longer than in Europe and certainly far longer than in North America. And then as a consequence, um, the feeling of nationalism, the, the feeling of a connection to a people uh, is not as important. Um, and so as an extension of that, ethnic conflict does not uh, become so dominant. Of course, it's, it's there in many different ways and it could be stoked uh, in, uh, by uh, opportunists in various regions of the world. So getting back to the most the classical case of balkanization, uh, we see uh, languages that heretofore, or a language that for many hundreds, if not thousands of years had been the same, uh, Serbo-Croatian, being turned into a southern dialect, a northern dialect, and other kinds of dialects, um, and a national language in which, it, I was in one of those countries recently, if you say something with the wrong ending or something of that nature, you're considered to be betraying the national interest. Um, so uh, in this way, I think that uh, you know, certainly the United States um, has a national language. Uh, it does tend to deny ethnic uh, and uh, linguistic minorities a uh, role. So for instance, there is very little bilingual education. Um, and that the United States, and this was part of my, my presentation, the United States um, in this way um, has uh, sort of homogenized a population, for the most part, it's a settler colonial state, if I may say, uh, but for the most part, the um, homogenization is of people from this part of the world. So much of the United States, uh, its uh, population that is of European origin, um, are from this part of the world, uh, Eastern, Southern, and other parts of Europe, as well as Central Europe, and uh, the British Isles. Uh, it eliminated that kind of linguistic, linguistic distinction. Um, and so these kinds of conflicts are not as present, or if not, I would argue, not present at all in the same way. The only areas in which this is a significant issue are locations uh, that the United States has colonized in the near abroad. The United States, like other large uh, countries or empires, have a near abroad as well, uh, meaning in this case uh, the Caribbean and so forth, where there is a great degree of resistance to the uh, imposition of the English language. Uh, Puerto Rico would be one of the most important cases uh, of this, but also other regions. There isn't a transition to uh, English that's easy. Uh, however, in other parts uh, of the world, such as the Philippines, uh, we see that uh, English has replaced um, Spanish as the dominant language after the United States began its colonial project in 1898 uh, to 1945 and then extended to the present era 
where a country that was um, colonized by Spanish is now in effect an English speaking country, or is it? Is it Tagal it's really Tagalog speaking country? Uh, but for, in this way we're really referring to a lingua franca, uh, a language that many people speak and is codified, that is used, and tends to diminish levels of conflict. Is there a lingua franca for specific regions, larger regions of Europe? Um, my work primarily is um, in the global south, so I've studied countries such as uh, South Africa or Southern Africa, uh, India, and East Asia as well. I'll focus first on East Asia, and that's the example, in my view, where you have the longest standing codified language, uh, or uh, yeah, long, a, a very long standing codified language, which is generally accepted by the population uh, of over 1.3 billion people. Um, and so the questions of nationalism in China, they may be at the periphery of conflicts, so for instance, with respect to Taiwan, uh, and maybe to a certain degree some of the uh, former uh, entropods such as Hong Kong and Macau, but by and large the populations, um, with the exception of Hong Kong, they speak uh, Chinese. Uh, there is no question about that Chinese language speaking. Um, so if you, whether you speak Cantonese or uh, whether you, you speak Mandarin, there is a general acceptance of the, litera uh, the literary form of Chinese uh, that um, everyone can recognize uh, and had been codified far earlier than probably most languages here and, in, and elsewhere or at an uh, early time. But also in this way, um, uh, the degree to which there is a tendency to try to unify language around a common theme. Um, so if uh, 1.3 billion people can get along on a specific language, um, I think it's, very, it's incumbent on us to understand uh, why there are greater levels of difference. Um, and my hunch is that the uh, societies, as old as they are in Europe compared to North America, uh, are not necessarily as old as some of the others uh, around the world, such as China which goes back 5,000 years. And uh, you have a empire that was consolidated far earlier uh, and, and really has not, um, under its new form, uh, has not broken apart. Uh, certainly there are conflicts that are going on. A second uh, point would be uh, uh, the question of the rights of national minorities to speak their languages. And one successful, um, I, don't, I don't really know this region as well, so one of the successful uh, aspects of the Chinese state after its revolution in 1949 was granting uh, minority linguistic and ethnic uh, groups, but especially linguistic groups, the rights to speak their language, the rights to maintain their culture within the larger system. So that, uh, yes, uh, as was pointed out earlier, people learned um, a multitude, well, they learned Chinese, but they also learned their local, uh, their national language as well. Uh, certainly to get ahead, one would have to understand Chinese. But there wasn't any kind of forced uh, diminution of uh, local languages um, in, uh, in that sense. So today, I think, um, and the remaining time, I wanted to go back to some of the work of uh, Eric Hobsbawm, who I, I may have recalled, that his name was uh, cited earlier today, um, and uh, the importance and the significance of uh, understanding what it means to be a people, what it means to be a nation, what it means to be an ethnic uh, group uh, in, in one way or another, and um, the distinctions that are drawn by Hobsbawm on his, uh, in his work on nationalism and literary, literary cultures, uh, they tend to focus on 
larger lingua francas and smaller ones. And so um, uh, within this region there are larger lingua francas that um, we can say could perhaps help people advance their status in life, economics, uh, prospects for the future and so forth. I, I won't uh, say which ones they are, but I think everyone knows on a you know, global basis uh, what those lingua francas are. Um, so e English is even more so uh, than a lingua, a lingua franca. I, I do think that it is a, you know, sh I, I, I did mention chauvinism in the uh, pre presentation. And there's a tendency, um, a tendency, there's absolutely a uh, fact that there is a form of English uh, speaking chauvinism on a global basis. Uh, so that over the last 20, 25 years, uh, most of Western Europeans, or very large, especially younger people, are now speaking English uh, in order to uh, advance their careers and so forth. Or, to communicate amongst themselves. Um, and not to say it's an, Engli an easy language to speak, it's actually somewhat complicated. And um, so we, what do we say about other smaller language groups? So if you're a Catalan uh, from Spain, uh, should you have the right to speak that or should, uh, language and to uh, ask for national self-determination on the basis of speaking Catalan. I don't want to say anything negative about that language, uh, but most uh, Catalans speak Spanish as well, and most Catalans um, uh, communicate on that basis within the government system. This also could be applied to England, for instance, uh, where Welsh uh, and Scottish uh, are dialects of the English language, and there have also been efforts to seek autonomy in a way that is in some respect uh, exclusive, uh, as well as the English people who see themselves perhaps as a separate uh, group from the Welsh, the Scots, and other groups who are speaking um, different types of, of language. Um, Hobsbawm argues that in fact uh, nationalism, ethnicity, language, they're really artifices uh, to a large extent, ex especially ethnicity. Uh, that are used to uh, advance specific uh, causes by political leaders uh, rather than uh, necessarily being the basis for uh, oppression. Uh, however, you know, we could also say that there are oppressed groups within uh, very, and I think it was demonstrated by those speakers so far within this region and beyond. Um, so people are hard pressed to speak English here in order to get ahead in the European Union or in the global economy. Uh, but within specific states, I was very you know, interested in the uh, questions that were raised with respect to certain types of Romanian uh, languages that uh, uh, the, the predecessor spoke or different dialects. Uh, where people felt in some respect to be uh, subordinated because they speak those languages. The question I would have is whether they're codified or not. Uh, may or may not be. Um, and, and then so, um, uh, when uh, you have a, there was a very large entity obviously in this region that existed, the Soviet Union, uh, and during that era, uh, you know, we could speak of uh, Russian chauvinism to a certain degree, um, in the sense that, um, that there's, there are chauvinisms of all types. Uh, and I would say, you know, American chauvinism is the dominant form uh, on a global basis today, uh, precisely because of its uh, uh, demands through a, a articulating its post-Cold War agenda of uh, democratization, the rule of law, human rights in the US uh, American context as a way of exporting it on a global level along with the English language. Um, you know, the question would be is that should uh, people in, uh, who were of specific uh, linguistic uh, backgrounds 
should they be denied their linguistic cultures within these somewhat large but also smaller entities. Um, and so, you know, sadly we do see the introduction of uh, uh, laws that say you can only speak I'm about to end. You can only speak one language. You cannot be educated in the language of your choice. Here is the point that, well, that I may close on, and I will close on in a minute, even if it is the lingua franca of a region. Um, so I, in closing, I would say that um, uh, in Europe, there is a tendency to focus to a far higher extent, especially in the present era, on linguistic differences than other areas, and that there should be a, um, and which may not actually have any great effect, there should be a acknowledgement that uh, it doesn't necessarily advance social, economic, uh, political rights, and it also can contribute, as we've seen in the pre preceding papers, uh, to the oppression of peoples. And I, my paper is many far longer. I tried to summarize those terms. And uh, once again, thank you for, uh, for coming and thank you.